Nossa, tô louca. Praise God. Gonna say a little word of prayer first. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come this morning, Father God, as your servant, Lord Jesus. Father, I'm asking you first off to just step me aside, Lord Jesus, and you come forth, Father God. I am ready to be used by you, Lord Jesus. Let your people hear what you have for them this morning, Lord Jesus. Father, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus, just come forth, come forth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning, good morning. This morning, I will be coming out of the books of First and Second Thessalonians. Praise God. I know that many of you and many around are uh, fascinated with the letters that Paul the Apostle wrote. I know because it came directly from his heart. Uh, just to recap just a little bit on our last lesson that, um, that I taught. Um, I mentioned uh, the first letters, because these books are basically letters that uh, Paul the Apostle wrote. Uh, on the first letter, it was um, he talked about was written after um, his co-worker, Timothy, came back with some exciting news for him that um, he was glad to hear about, because, you know, Paul was worried about the people's heart when he had to lead them at the time. He was worried about their heart that they had wandered away from God, but to his surprise, they were still praising God. They were still doing what they should do. And you know, this brought me back to, I know that pastor would be happy, and I know that she's happy to know that we are still continuing on. We are praising God. We are still going forth in Jesus' name. So this pleased Paul. In his heart, he was definitely pleased. And the second letter was written uh, right after the, uh, the first one. And you know, that's when uh, some had recalled Paul, they questioned his uh, professional writing because Christian had believed that it was useless to work. And so, and because the, word, the, the end of the world was coming, they thought it was useless to work. Right there, their heart was in the wrong place. I thought about uh, the world we know is coming to an end. Are we gonna just stop everything? We're gonna stop worshiping God? Worshiping God? We're gonna stop lifting him up? No, we wanna continue on and not be like them. So basically today, as we come out of the books of First and Second Thessalonians, we're gonna focus on the heart. I wanna stop and just say just a little short story real quick. I, uh, when I was back home, uh, I, I spoke to the Lord. I said, Lord, you got to give me something because I know Elder Harris is going to put me on that pro on that schedule and I don't have anything. And, and, and you know, when you speak to God, he listens. And uh, all of a sudden, I noticed that everything that I, I was reading or listening to is start talking about the heart, the heart. And I said, well, OK, then then after I left home, Mississippi, I went to Texas to stay with my daughter a couple of weeks. And God was still pouring out everything that I read or look. I even see stuff on billboard or the television. Be playing. It was started talking about the person's heart. I said, well, God, if this what you want me to talk about, I'm going to talk about the heart. So that's what we're going to focus the lesson on today, the, the heart of the people. Praise God. So if you have your Bibles before you, will you turn with me to the second chapter of Thessalonians? And we're going to go to the second, uh, second Thessalonians, second chapter. Praise God. But before you go there, I want to say this. Um, uh, if you go back to uh, first Thessalonians, uh, the fourth chapter, I believe, Paul told the people to live a life pleasing God. He told them to live a life 
pleasing God. If he didn't have a heart to encourage the people to continue to praise God, this right here was proven that Paul had love for God. He was putting God first. He was loving him with his whole heart. Amen. So if I wasn't used to a title, and there was several one that came to me, there was one that stuck out so much with me, and it was, our heart belongs to God. Our hearts belong to God. So we're going to read 2 Thessalonians, second chapter, and we're going to go down to verse 16 and verse 17. Praise God. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which have loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Praise God. We know God truly loves us. He loves his people and he's chosen each and every one of us as to be his own. Our purpose is to please God and not man. To please God and not man. It would be him alone that will examine the motives of our hearts. We know that evilness is all Evil things is happening. It's all over the world right now. Every day, the hearts of people is gone so cold, very cold. Our heart has to be in the right place at all times. And I want to read you Hebrew 4 and 12, that our heart has to be in the right place at all times. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Praise God. Our heart has to be in the right place. Now, as we, as I read uh, the first two uh, verses, uh, 16 and 17, these verses are very important and to read. Uh, sometimes when you just really need some encouragement, uh, I know throughout the Bible, there are so many uh, uh, scriptures that we can read of encouragement, but these are two uh, scriptures that uh, you can read to encourage you. God is so amazing that we should never doubt his love for us because his love has been proven to, to us over and over. And I know everyone on Zoom and here can say that God has proved his love to us. But to go on uh, with these two verses, it started off, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And I wanted to elaborate a little bit on, 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 on those two verses real quick. Um, I have eight things, I think it's like eight things I want to say about it. Um, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Right there, we already know that we can go direct to Jesus. We can go and call, we call to him directly. We know that he is our God. We know that he is our Father. We know him. Second, I mean third, we know that he give us everlasting, never-ending consolation. Is he not there for us? Praise God. Fourth, we definitely know he give us good hope. If you read Romans 15 and 13, it tells us that. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. And he also give us grace. If we read Hebrew 4 and 16, it tell us that. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Praise God. And 6, 
and he comforts our heart. Doesn't he do that? God wants us to tell us every time what's on our mind, what's worrying us, what's going on. God wants us to do that. Seven, he has savage every he has established us in every good word. And I will read 2 Thessalonians 3 and 3 for you. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. God wants us to have confidence in him, to trust him and believe him and know that he will protect us from all of this evilness that's in the world. He has always been faithful to us. Praise God. And last, number eight, and he will establish us in every good work. And I want to read 2 Timothy 3 and 17 that tells us that. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished un unto all good work. God will make us complete and equipped for every good work. He'll do that. Mostly, Throughout Paul's journey, he was around people who had, whose heart was not right. We as children of God, we face all kind of people uh, alone and with situation every day. The hearts of the people are becoming so cold, as I said before. Have you noticed? You can't even walk up to people and say, hey, how you doing? They'll turn you, their face on you or anything, vice versa. But God has a way to change the hearts of people and situation. Praise God. I want to give a little testimony throughout this um, lesson. I have a couple of testimonies that I want to share with each of you. That how God will change your heart. He had to do that for me. A while back, I became very angry because someone had did me so wrong that it hurt me so badly. I became so angry in my heart to the point I constantly stayed mad every time I thought about it. And I already know that was wrong. I didn't, and this is way back, I've been back a little bit. I didn't go to pastor about it because I don't go to her with a lot of nonsense. I, I never did go to her with a lot of nonsense. I didn't go to her but she came to me sometimes later. You see, God sees everything. I won't speak on the conversation because you will only hear my side of it and that's gone now. But I just want to tell you how I was feeling, what the point I'm trying to get across is how I was feeling in my heart, being a child of God. Pastor had a pure heart a gentle heart. Every time you spoke with her, you felt good when you left there. I truly miss the phone calls, the, the conversation, and I'm sure I'm not alone. But anyway, this feeling was a situation. It had to go. I had to realize, even though that someone did this, I soon came to realization I was no better than them. Why? Because of the way I was feeling in my heart. I knew that that was not good. God had to show me this. After all that time that I had this feeling in my heart, God had to show me this. And you being a child of God, he gonna make it right for you. He's not gonna let you walk around like that. He had to change my heart because I represented him. And we as children of God do not let ourselves get in that position. We can't do that. We got to have a godly heart, a pure heart, a clean heart, a wise heart. And I want to read you Proverbs 16, 21. It says, the wise are known for their understanding and pleasant word are persuasive. Praise God. 
I was listening, I told, uh, I think two weeks ago, I told you that I listened to two ministers that, that are really on key with the Bible and that and they do the Bible yearly. And I, I've been listening to one of them. Uh, I think it's been about seven or eight years that I've been listening to him. But this this other one, uh, older gentleman, I think I've mentioned his name a several times, Dr. Vernon McGee. He's deceased uh, back in 1988. But I don't know if it's his son or people at his church. They're continuing his uh, legacy, his preaching going on. So one day he mentioned in his teaching that a child of God living in this world, he said, a child of God cannot be proper with the world. It caught my attention. Reason being, the world will not hear or see what the word of God means unless the Holy Spirit of God reveal it to them. It's our heart that the, that the Spirit speaks to. It's our heart he fills with love. It's our heart that he fills with joy. It's our heart that he fills with peace and hope. It's our heart where the love of God dwell. So the love of God has to dwell in, dwell in our heart. Everything you do, your heart is set on God. And it means you will do right by him because you simply know he is there for you and he's with you. The heart of a true believer chooses to obey God and love God with all your heart. And that means have passionately in love with God. How many is passionately in love with God? I'm passionately in love with God. Paul loved God also. But you know what it had, God had to do? It took God to turn him from a killer of Christian into a lover of Christ and his people. So I pose a question. Think about it. What did God have to do to get you, us, me, where we are today? What did God have to do to us? Paul was called by God, and when you are called by God, it doesn't matter what you think in your heart that you're going to do in life. God always already has a plan for your life. Paul's heart was changed just like that. And once it was changed, he trusted God and he knew God was with him all the way. I pose another question. What did God have to change in your heart to get you to trust him? Psalms 37 verses 3 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pastor." Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give the desire of your heart. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. See, the heart is considered the seat of life, the seat of strength. It's, it means mind, soul, spirit, or one's entire emotional nature and understand it. So after Paul's, his conversion, his concern was the people to just worship the one and true God with all their heart. As I stated early, Paul's heart was chained. So, so much that it caused him to write uh, letters when he couldn't reach the people. This is why he wrote the letters because he couldn't reach them. There's still a way that you can get to people if you can't get to them, you know, see them. There's so many ways that you can get to their heart. In his heart, he was wanting to do the will of God. Praise God. His letters reveal him as a remarkable person when you read them. He was dedicated. He was compassionate. He was emotional. Sometimes harsh and angry, but he was clever and quick-witted, supple in argumentation, and above all, possessing a soaring, passionate commitment to God. 
Jesus Christ. He was committed to God. I have a lot of little sermon notes and I want to say it all to you. You have to have a strong desire to stay committed to God or you will struggle when the going gets tough. Now, when it comes to Paul learning to see the people again, because he wanted to see them again, in his heart, he was so worried about them. But, you know, after he got the, uh, the message from uh, Timothy, he was, he was okay. But when he was long, longing to see the people, I want to read 1 Thessalonians 2, 17, that talks about that. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in prison, not in heart, endeavor the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. When I read this scripture that I just read, I began to think about even in our everyday life, all the things that we go through, the things that we do, the things that suddenly come across our path, our heart should never leave God. You know, cause everything with everything going on in the world, there's so much gonna come after you, but your heart should never leave God. We should never want to be where God is not. Amen. Now, when we should always surround ourselves with people that have a heart for God. I mean, it's hard, a child of God, to sit among people that don't have a heart for God. It's very hard for me, and I'm sure it's hard for you guys, too, that it's hard if, if the person don't have a heart for God. But if you see where God can use you to, to, to minister to them people, do it. But don't stand and argue with, with people. Have you, you have noticed the things when uh, you're surrounded by people with a heart of God. You notice the difference. Even being around successful people will cause your life to be successful. I love the motto that Deacon Stevenson uses. She says, success in your hands. I like that. God will show you ways to success. If you read jo Joshua 1 verses 8 and 9, it will give you step by step to be successful. I'm going to read that for you. That's Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do accordingly to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosper, and then thou shalt have good success. See, right there, you need to follow God. You need to meditate on his word. You don't need to uh, neglect his word. Ponder it in your heart. Recite his word daily. You walk around the house. I know I got scriptures all around my house. And then sometimes you walk around the house, just quote God's word. Say it out loud. And once you follow the instruction that uh, verse 8 and 9 just gave you, you'll begin to see it. You'll begin to take it in, and you'll know it. Praise God. But Paul, oh, let me read verse 9. Have, I, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thy dismay. For the Lord thy God is with thee. If you hang on to that, I need to read that for myself. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee. I had to read that out loud again to myself. Praise God. For the Lord thy God is with thee. Where is so thy goest? So this is step by step, but we just followed. But getting back to Paul, he told them to live a good life, pleasing God. The world is full of challenges. We got to stay strong and trust God. As the people here may have thought Paul had abandoned them, that wasn't even the case. Paul always had them in his heart, and he prayed for them, 
for time to see them again. He prayed and he prayed. God also has us in his heart. He has never abandoned us. If anything, we abandoned him. So here, it was only through persecution that he, that had separated Paul and his friend. Word. That's a, that's a note I put down here for myself. So if I say it out loud, you grab onto it too. Word. It's when we let things of this world separate us from God is when we feel God has left us and abandoned us. But if we can just remember the cross, and what he did for us through Christ on that cross, that's it. What he did for us on that cross, God will always remember us because he will never forget his son. We got to really know how much God loves us. Do we know how much God loves us? He loves us. Sometimes you have to just sit and think, God really loves me. I mean, look at us now. Yeah. Look where we at with God now. He loves us. Yeah. So sometimes you got to sit there and just say, God loves me. Abandoning us is not the problem. It's when we are doubting him. His goodness is the problem. When we think that he's abandoned us. He's never abandoned us. He's still God. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrew 13 and 8. We just need to stay on bended knees. When I say that, we need to get out on our knees all the time and pray more and know what you're praying to and know who, what you're praying and know who you are praying to. Another testimony from myself. In my childhood days, there have been many pictures that I viewed of Jesus going in the house, I think probably in my house too, my mom's house. Going in pictures in houses, you see pictures of Jesus. Okay. A lot of you remember that, right? You see pictures of Jesus. And I assume that's that's how Jesus looked as a child. Now, I'm a child. That seemed that's how he looked. The strangest thing that there was uh, a few different images of him. You know, there were different types of pictures away. You you know what I'm talking about, Mother Rose. <laughs> that you see all those different types of pictures that was uh, that they said was Jesus. From a child's mind, I suppose it satisfied my imagination at the time. But the most important is to hear his voice and know his voice. Deuteronomy 4 and 12. I'm trying to say the scriptures slowly uh, so you can get it if you want to write them down. Deuteronomy 4 and 12 tells us, and the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye, ye heard the voice of the word, but saw no simil similitude. Only you heard a voice. You see, God speaks to us from the heart of the fire. We hear his voice, but don't see a form of a man, just his voice. So there is no symbol um, to nothing, no comparison to, of nothing. God loves us and he saved us, but he didn't save us because he loved us. You see, God is merciful. He saved us by grace and he didn't save us because we were good little boys and good little girls either. We are saved because of the mercy of God. I was listening again to someone one day and heard them say something that was so true. And I was like, wow. He said, God is a good God, true enough. We know this. God is a good God. But he's not going to just open the back door of heaven just to let us slip in. It, you know, he's not going to say, oh, Elder Harry, you've been good. Come, come on in. Oh, he's going to get somebody out the street. Oh, son, come on in. I see you over there. Come on in. He's not going to do that. I'm here to tell you that's not going to happen. Praise God. He's already died on the cross for us. And he loved the world true enough. He loved us. 
John 3, 16, you know this scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He's talking about everlasting life. Everlasting mean, meaning eternal, alive, forever, never coming to an end. Praise God. Everlasting life. I've been in church all my life. Under great ministers, great Sunday school teachers as a child, the seeds were planted. Mm -hmm. I had a love for God and always in my heart wanted to do good by him. When I heard my Sunday school teacher talking about Jesus, I wanted to do good for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that was in my heart. I wanted to do good. I never wanted to be a bad child. And I wasn't. I'll be clear that up. <laughs> I've told many times in here how as a child I was fascinated when I read Genesis, how God made the, the, the world. You know, I was fascinated by that. So at nine, I, I can't remember, it was nine, 10, 11, but I was a young child and I said, I'm going to go, I'm going to read the Bible. You know, I told the story so many times. And you know, Exodus was hard too, but when I got to the book of uh, Leviticus, oh, it was really hard for me to understand. So I guess I, I shattered away at that time. How many times as a kid, you dream of being successful? I wanted to be successful. I remember Mrs. Wright and Mrs. Martin, how they taught us about Jesus. In my little heart, I never ever wanted to go to do God wrong or make him mad. I actually wanted to be successful. I had lots of dreams. I never told my husband this, but I actually dreamed one time, man, I watch a television, I want to be an actor. <laughs> I never told you that. <laughs> I never told uh, him that, but I did. As a little child, I, I had lots of dreams that I what, what I wanted to be. But I wanted to make God proud, and I wanted to make my parents proud. As I grew older, my heart for doing things in the church was growing. I was doing a lot of things. I had a desire to learn more about Jesus. I enjoyed working in the church and working for the Lord in his house. That was good and well, but it was much more to do than just good work. We all know that our works count, but it was good to do good work. I knew in my heart, I had a desire to follow Jesus. Another testimony. One Sunday, we were visiting my brother's wife's church, and it was doing revival. We went plenty of revival, plenty of revival. But something caught my attention as a young girl. I watched as they took a young teenage girl out of the church. They quiet had song, the spirit was high in the church. I watched that they took this young girl out. And uh, I continued to watch. And then when church was over, you know, this is the time we have those big revivals, we have all that eating and food and whatever. But as I went outside, it caught my eye again where they were putting her in the car. And it, I looked and I was like, what is happening to her? What I was seeing, I wanted it because I knew that it had something to do with God and it was a good thing. So I, if it can happen to her, it can happen to me, but I was admiring what was happening to this young girl. Yeah, it was the gift of the Holy Spirit on this young teenage appearing in her life. Right there, I began my whole heart desire was to follow Jesus. With Jesus in our heart, we are like Joshua, having to having a desire to follow him wholeheartedly. This is the start of being successful too, by following God wholeheartedly. And that's serving him every day through your faith, praying regularly, regular, and helping others trust in God and his purpose. Two things are happening right there. We are taking on responsibility that are given to us and we are being warriors 
for God. Everything we do for the Lord has to be from the heart, your heart. This also means having a heart of love for everyone, too, because God sees everything. We can't be Holy Ghost filled and walk around in our heart not liking, liking other certain people. We can't, we can't be like that. God knows us better than we know ourselves. We should never trust our tongue when our heart is bitter. We need to hush until we heal. Sometimes you can say something to someone that will cause that person a downfall. We can't do that. We can't do that to a person. You never know what this person is going to. That's why I try to be nice to everyone. Watch what you say to people. God can see what we and others cannot. And that is the inner motivation and intentions of the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. We know the scripture, but the Lord looks at the heart. First Samuel 16 and seven. God knows our heart individually. We can't hide anything from him. Psalms 33, 15 said, he made our heart so he understands everything we do. We need to have it in our heart to pray daily. Get together with your family. Call family that far off or right here in your same town. Call them, pray with them, talk with them about the Lord. If you're holding anything from the past, let it go. Yeah. Let it go. But first, we need to find it in our heart just to let it go because our heart belongs to God. We can't serve him if your heart is corrupt. We all need to repent. We all are sinners. This is what Jeremiah said in uh, 17, chapter 17, verse 9. He said, the heart, our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We all could be at a point where we don't know what we would do under any circumstances. That's if we don't have Jesus in our heart. Look at what's happening the past few months. Innocent people lost their lives. Think about the little children that went to school that day. Think about the parent that, that some parents I know mentioned that they went to the school, they had a party because it was about the last day of school. And this lady in her heart, she felt bad that she let her child stay there to have fun with her classmates because they weren't going to see them until the following year. And, and, and her child was there when this person that had no heart uh, went in there and shot those babies. Innocent lives left. So in her heart, she feel bad that she she killed her own child. She shouldn't feel like that because she was, in her heart, she was showing love, letting that child stay there and be with her classmate. But innocent people are being taken because the world don't have Jesus in their heart. Billy Graham preached a sermon once. He said, guard your heart. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Our heart is extremely valuable. We don't guard worthless things. Remember, God will forgive all of us for our sins if we just repent. We need our sins forgiven. Uh, I want to go something else. Uh, I want to remember the story, um, read this verse, Proverbs 13 and 3. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that open wide his lip shall have destruction. In other words, be careful what you say and protect your life. A careless talker destroys himself. And when I bring that scripture out, it takes me back to the story in Judges on um, Jephthah, I think his, his name is pronounced, pronounced uh, what happened to him. He made a vow to the Lord that if he returned safely from 
fighting the Ammonite, he would offer something, is what the Bible said, that came out of his house as a burnt offering to the Lord. I don't know what he was expecting to come out of his house, a sheep, a goat, a dog, or whatever, but his daughter was the first that came out of the hall, out of the house. He immediately regretted the vow that he had made to the Lord, which bound him to sacrifice his daughter to God. And that was his only daughter, only daughter. And he had to carry out his vow. So my point in bringing this story out is be careful making, if you are not sure in your heart, when making a vow to the Lord that you cannot keep or that you're not going to fall through to. Make sure your heart is pure, clean when you speak. Luke 6 and 45, Luke 6 and 45 said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Be careful when you speak. Be careful what you speak, especially to the Lord. Sometimes God will expose your heart too. Remember the story of David, a man considered to be after God's own heart. God will allow you to see yourself for who you are, and that's what he did to David. David was a cruel thief. He was an adulterer, a murderer. He saw all of it, and he knew that he had sinned against God. He had despised the word of the Lord. God had been good to David. He'd been good to David. He did a lot for David, and he did a lot for us. You can't play with God now. He's doing good to you. He's being good to you. He's done so much for you. David lived as if he was separated from God. We can't live like that. We can't live like we're separated from God. David despised his union with God. He knew of God's anointing. He knew of God's presence. He knew God's word and this union. But yet he cast it aside like it was nothing. It, Everybody in here know you can't cast God to the side or put him on a back burner, come back later. Oh, God, you got to praise God now and forever. David just went on ahead and then just indulged himself because what he wanted, he wanted. He didn't think about, oh, God, he didn't think about none of that. He just indulged himself and lust and murder did it all. We can, listen, we can uh, despise the union we have with God. And right there, what do you expect God to do? What do you expect God to do for you? What do you expect him to do? And everything we do in life, like this situation with David, shows that even though we can deny and despise our union with God, but God would not despise or deny us. He definitely will discipline us. Oh, yeah. But he will not abandon us or reject us. He will send someone to restore our heart. We all been blessed. How many times have you seen people done wrong? You know they done wrong, but God sent someone to restore their heart. Psalms 51 David prayed and beseeched God to restore his heart and make it new again, make it right again. It's very foolish to think you can do wrong and try to cover it up, thinking God would not know about it. <laughs> I pity the one that tried to do that. David had displeased the Lord, so he prayed for forgiveness and cleaning, asking God to create in him a clean heart. I don't know about everyone in here to this morning or on Zoom, but I want God to give me a pure and clean heart. 
You need to have a generous heart. Another story I want to share for my daily reading, and it's coming out of First Chronicle. It was about the king who was merciful, but the debtor was not. This debtor had been paid in full. His debt was paid. He didn't have to pay the king anything. Ain't God good? He didn't have to pay. How many times? I want, you know, last night when I was going over this, this is not in my note, but I thought about when I met my husband. He told me about, and I, I know you don't mind if I shared it because you have shared it, that you had a tax problem. But God, let's just say God paid it in full. You are debt free from that. But this debtor had been, God, his debt had been paid free. He didn't have to pay the king anything. Mercy had been shown to him, but look what happened. This ungrateful man did not show mercy to those that owe him. What had been done good to him, he turned around and did bad to others. Why would he do something like that? Why would he, after somebody done show, oh, you don't have, you don't have to pay me, you debt free. You gonna go and try to collect. Where's your heart? His heart did not change even by the mercy the king had given him. I know when I've been blessed, it makes me have such, I mean, I've already got a generous heart. It makes me have a much more generous heart. And uh, the testimony uh, that we've given before in here uh, about we uh, have been running all day, my husband and I, and uh, so, it was too late to go home and try to cook. So we went through this line to get food and when we got ready to pay for our food, uh, the, the cashier said, oh, the car before you pay for your meal. And we were like, really? Oh, wow, thank you, Jesus. So what my husband did, because of the goodness of his heart, he said, well, take this money and pay for the next car. Now, rather that continue on is the goodness of the people's heart. That, that it continue on. But I just thank God for there are still some people out there with generous hearts mm -hmm. that did that. But back to this debtor, he was debt free. Why on earth would he be so desperate and greedy to collect from others, especially after his blessing? He just didn't have a generous heart. That's right. You see, the heart of the flesh never want, and I, I researched this, and I, I want to uh, read what I found. It says the heart of the flesh never wants to admit its death. When the death is pointed out, and even when it is forgiven, the heart doesn't receive it as such. The heart of the flesh is still trying to pay back and earn to rid itself of the shame. It's pride by extracting it from others. The devil wants to free himself of the shame. He is desperate to never be in that position again. Not thinking about what he's doing to the other people. The king had accepted the loss because of his generous heart. Just like God has accepted the death for us. He took on our insurmountable depth and say one word forgive it we will never be able to collect from others to pay back what we owe to God never there's no way we be able to pay it back Paul's heart was what God was looking for what kind of heart is God looking for in you he's looking for a loving heart we read 1 Corinthians 13. Every day, we're supposed to. A heart with love abiding his, by his word. If we are going to read 1 Corinthians daily and not abide by his word, why are we wasting time reading it? He looks for a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. When God comes back, we all want to stand before him with a pure heart. He's looking for a committed heart. 
committed and obeying him and being faithful always. God is looking for those who with a heart that is complete towards him. Second Chronicles 16, nine says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. It's in the Bible. I didn't make it up. It's in the word. Herein thou has done foolishness. Therefore, from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Never be so quick to judge what we see on the outside of a person. We are not doing like God because, like I said earlier, he looks at the heart and not the outside appearance. God doesn't look at the same things that we do. He knows that our real selves are contained in the heart. And he wants us to engage with others based on what is in what is in their heart and not their physical qualities. God wants us wants to fill every area of our mind, heart, and soul with his love. So we got to learn to let him love us. I know this is short, but I hope that someone got something from it. In my closing, know that Paul's heart belonged to God and so do ours. Matthew 6, 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Proverbs 3 and 5, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. Proverbs 4, 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Psalms 51.10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalms 73.16, my flesh and my heart fail it, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Philippians 4 and 7, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, and my peace I give unto you. Not as the world give it, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And last, Psalms 37 and 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desire of thy heart. All these scriptures that I just said to you is saying to us, our heart belongs to God. Mm. We are to give our heart to God wholly and completely. Your heart belongs to God. Don't just honor him with your lips and your heart be far from him. He knows what's in our heart and what is in our heart will show on the outside. More than anything, we need to pour our heart out to him. Ask him for a clean heart because we want a clean heart before him. Don't walk around with a jealous heart but have joy in your heart. Remember, God knows your heart. You're not hiding anything. Scripture says man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the inner. Be very careful what you say to people and don't let negative stuff enter into your heart. Always have the love of God in your heart and show the love of God that is in your heart. Why? Because your heart belongs to God. That's all I have for you.